All right, so the summer before last, my wife and I took the kids on a road trip to visit her family. They live in uh, Cape Charles, Virginia. So we drove from here to there, from Albuquerque to there. And uh, I'm, you know, pretty deep in the tattoo thing, so I kind of looked along the way and was kind of looking to see if there's anything I could include that was tattooing. And there's a place called the Tattoo Archive, run by a guy named Chuck Eldridge that we went, we stopped at in uh, North Carolina, which was pretty cool. And then uh, I knew there was this guy who tattooed. Uh, they uh, Cape Charles is right across the Chesapeake Bay from uh, from Norfolk, Virginia, and that's where this guy uh, Cap Coleman. He's an old school tattooer. He had a shop for many years, like World War One, World War Two, probably up until like, I can't remember, it was like maybe 50s, 60s. They outlawed tattooing in Virginia, so it kind of basically shut him down. He'd been tattooing there for 40 years or something. And uh, anyway, I knew he was from there. So I had some, some books on him and stuff, and I, uh, did a little research and I was able to locate his, his grave. And also there was a guy who uh, worked for him who's really well known in the tattoo world named Paul Rogers. And he worked with him there and he was kind of from the area. And so I actually asked the guy, Chuck Eldridge, over at the Tattoo Archive of Virginia where he was buried. And so he actually found out for me. Gave me the ad, you know, gave me the uh, place, and I called them, and they told me what's up. And it turns out they're like 15 miles from each other, buried. So uh, one of the days we were out there, me and one of my daughters took a little road trip. It was about, I don't know, like 60, 50, 60 miles from where we were, and uh, got grave rub things. It was pretty cool. So I've had them sitting around for like a long ass time, you know, a year and a half, and uh, the other day. I was talking to my wife about it, and she was like, you haven't hung those yet? I'm like, no. She's like, let me get this straight. You've hung prints you bought, but this thing you traveled halfway across the country to do, you didn't hang. I don't even know you. So it kind of got me thinking, maybe I should hang them. So I finally bought some frames for them. So that's what I'm doing. Paul Rogers, he, uh, He's an old schooler. He started uh, tattooing, I believe, back in the, I want to say the 20s. This is one of the few books that I've been able to find on him. And I think it's a self-published dealie by Don Lucas. And it is pretty hard to find. Um, and it's incomplete. He actually passed away while they were writing his autobiography, or his biography on his autobiography. He, had a, he didn't pass away, but he had a stroke, a debilitating stroke. And so the book actually ends there. But it's pretty rich in the, in the beginning. and. And, uh, you know, I'm not the expert on this guy. I just am a, an admirer, observer, you know, respect-er. <laughs> but I've heard, you know, from the things I've been able to read, he's uh, one of the genuine good guys. And one of the big things that he's regarded for, I mean, he's regarded a lot of, like, respected pretty much all the way around in tattooing. One of his biggest, biggest deals is tattoo machine building. He, uh... He built some of the best ones around. In fact, this is one he built in 1985 that uh, I still use today. I, I mean, I've used it like on a few tattoos and it works like a champ. So anyway, I use this one. So yeah, he's really well known for his machine building. He uh, started a few shops of like, a, like he co-founded a lot of you know places that exist today. There's a place called Ink Smith and Rogers that he co-founded with Eric King Smith, who did a guest spot here a while back. That is still in existence. That, that shop's still here in Jacksonville, Florida today. He started off uh, tattooing. You know, he was, from what I understand, from a, a mining town in the south. And uh, pretty much, I think that was one of his only options. And he found a way out through tattooing and through the circus. And so he was like a circus performer and tattooer and traveled. And he kind of, kind of traveled the country, he met his wife, uh, I think, doing that. Her dad, I believe, owned one of the companies he worked for at one point. And they got married, and he was like, you, you can see when you read anything about him, he was madly in love with his wife. It's kind of a cool, like, love story, basically. So he was also, he when he built machines, he never really had a big factory. Like he was, he was, even though he started all these big things, he was always like a down, 
DIY kind of dude. So like even at the end, you know, the 85, he was already pretty, you know, 80 years old. And he has a shed in the backyard and that's where he called it his iron factory. And that's where he built all these, like he would go to the scrap yard and pick up sheets of metal to make these tattoos, like these machines. He was just, do it yourself. Yeah, so that's Paul Rogers. I mean, to this day, I mean, this is probably my most, my most treasured uh, uh, machine. I mean, the fact that I can still use it is what makes me love it. Uh, Logan and I tattooed each other this year with this on Sailor Jerry's 100th birthday. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, you know, by the time he got to be an older man, I mean, most anybody who knew anything in tattooing knew he was the man. So there's him in his shed building these machines. That's Cap Coleman. He's the guy who taught Paul Rogers a lot of stuff, and he was, he's basically one of the originators, I would say. And he was one of the more prolific and really first, like really good American tattooer. He's the guy that a lot of people attribute, like some of these sailor designs, he actually designed them. We recycle a lot of them. This is the guy who actually like designed a lot of them. And he was, uh, he was good, he was fast, he was a character. He tattooed all the way until they made it illegal in uh, in Norfolk, and um, after that he retired, and he started investing. And like he didn't have any children, he had a niece, and I guess like from some of the stories I've read, his niece would like give to charity and stuff like that, and he'd be like, "Why do you do that? You're wasting your money." And by the time he had died, he had been such a good investor. He had like a I can't even remember the amount, but he had a pretty decent chunk, and he left it all to charity. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I went and visited his his spot too and got a rubbing just to kind of. I kind of. This is. There's a pretty good story Eric Kingsmith has about this painting that one day I'll hopefully he'll tell you guys. It's pretty crazy. So yeah, here's some old Coleman pictures, I guess. There's Cap Coleman as a youngster. There's him as an old dude. Yeah, so he's kind of like the granddaddy, I would say, because he, Kev Coleman was like, what, from what I can gather, like I said, I'm not an expert on any of these guys. I just, I you know, try to absorb every little sliver that's out there, which is not very much. But he, to me, seemed like one of those just, Hard working, just blue collar dude, and just nose to the grindstone, did it, did it, did it, and was actually very smart though, and just worked it. I mean, you look at every picture of his shop, and it's just like, he was just great work ethic kind of thing. Same thing I bet, you know, I can kind of get from uh, Paul Rogers. You know, it's kind of like one of the spirits, one of the things that was attractive to tattooing to me are these guys, the spirit of these kind of guys. It's like, I'm like, ah. This is just my way of trying to pay my respect to one of the guys who laid the bricks for what I'm making my living doing today, you know what I mean? I wish I could be 